Hi, my name is Rich Harris. I'm an engineer at Vassell and the creator of Svelte. I made this course so that you would have the definitive guide for learning how to use Svelte and SvelteKit to build apps of all shapes and sizes from small demos all the way up to full stack production grade applications. In this course, you'll learn what Svelte is and how to use it to build more robust and maintainable applications using all the features that Svelte has to offer from reactivity and scope CSS to actions, transitions, animations, and component composition. I hope you enjoy it. At the heart of Svelte is a powerful system of reactivity for keeping the DOM in sync with your application state. So when the user interacts with your application, the state will change. We want the view of that state to change in response. So we haven't learned about event handlers just yet, but we will soon. For now, I just want you to add the onClick equals increment code to the button in app.svelte. And what that's telling us is that when we click this button, it will call this increment function. Inside here, we're going to change the value of count. And the way that we're going to do that is just by assigning to it. We're not using an API for this. We're not using a set state or something like that. We are just assigning to the variable. And the compiler can see that, and it will instrument your code in such a way that says, we need to re-render specific parts of this component. And it will do it as efficiently as it can. And so now, when we click this button, you'll see that the number does, in fact, increment. OK, so we've seen that if you reference a reactive variable like count directly in your markup, it will update. But there are often times when you're building user interfaces that you will have something that depends on a reactive variable. So for example, you might want to track the doubled value of count. And in Svelte, we have a concept called reactive declarations. And they look a little bit funny. They look like this, dollar colon doubled equals count. Now, there's a call out here that says this might look a little alien. This is, in fact, valid JavaScript. That dollar is a syntactical construct called a label. And it's something that you use when you're using for loops and while loops. It allows you to break out to a specific part of your code. Um, it's not useful in most parts of your code. It's only useful when you're dealing with for loops. Um, and so it's kind of like a, a free piece of syntax that's just lying around without much to do. So on the Svelte team, we said, well, why don't we co-opt this? Why don't we use this to declare a value that reactively updates when anything that it depends on changes? So what happens here is the compiler looks at that statement, double equals count. Uh, sorry, I need to add the times two, otherwise it's not much use. Um, and it sees that the value of doubled now depends on the value of count. So whenever the value of count updates, the value of doubled will also update. And so we can now use that inside our markup. After the button, we'll add a new element, a paragraph, and we'll say count doubled is doubled. Now, if we click the button, does anyone want to take a wild guess as to what's going to happen? One double is two, two double is four, and so on. Uh, now, you could, of course, just write count times two here, because you can use arbitrary JavaScript inside these expressions. Uh, but you might find there are cases where you, you are using that value in multiple places, or you need to have other things that depend on the value of doubled. Uh, and so reactive statements are valuable in that context. So, so far, we've been assigning to values inside our components, and that's been causing the DOM to update immediately. But sometimes we don't want that. Sometimes we want values to update uh, gradually over time. For example, this progress bar here, you know, it's cool that we can update the progress bar like that, but it would be nice if it smoothly animated to its new value. And in Svelte, we can do that with motion stores. Here, progress is a writable store that starts with the value of 0. And every time we press one of these buttons, it sets a new value. But if we change that writable to a tween store, like that, and replace the Svelte store import with Svelte motion, now when we press the buttons, the bar animates smoothly. Looks a little bit robotic at the moment. Uh, and that's because we need to add an easing function. An easing function is a function that takes 
uh, a value between 0 and 1 and returns a value between 0 and 1. By default, it's just this. This is the linear easing function that we saw before. But you can do something like we could square t like this, and then it'll, it'll do some very different behavior. We actually have a library of easing functions available uh, in Svelte. These uh, formula were devised by Rob Penner many years ago, and we just have a whole stack of them. Um, one of the most useful ones I find is called cubic out, which kind of smoothly, like it starts fast and then it smoothly um, transitions to the final state. So let's replace that. Right, I find that to be quite a, quite a pleasing um, motion, and we can set the duration to whatever we want. We can make it a super slow tween or a, or a very fast tween, depending on what it is we're using the motion for. Um, there's a whole bunch of options that you can pass to the tween store, including a custom interpolate function which allows you to interpolate non-numeric values. For example, maybe you want to transition between two colors. Well, you can pass a function that knows how to interpolate between two colors. And you can also pass those options when you call progress.set to override the default values. So tweening is one way to get motion, but another way that is more applicable in some circumstances is to use some rudimentary spring physics. It works particularly well for values that are frequently changing, such as the mouse position. If I move the mouse around here, you will see that the, the orange dot follows the cursor perfectly. And again, we can just replace the store that represents the coordinates of the mouse with a spring store. Just get rid of those, replace with spring, and again, we're going to import that from Svelte Motion. And now when I move the mouse around, the circle kind of lags behind a little bit and moves in this, this pleasing, uh, smooth manner. Now, springs have uh, some settings that you can apply to them. They have a stiffness setting and a damping setting that determines how they respond to changes. And we can specify our own initial values. So for the spring value here, let's for the coordinates, we'll specify a stiffness of 0.1. One would mean that the spring was perfectly stiff. Zero would mean that it's not stiff at all. And we'll set a damping value of 0.25 like that. And now we see we get some, some very different and more springy behavior. And we can change those. And you can sort of get a feel for how the different values will affect the behavior of the spring. OK, so we've got the, um, the main component telling the game component to start a new game. We now need to get the state back from the game component into the page. We'll do that with an event handler on play. We're going to set the state to playing. And that's going to have the effect of getting rid of the modal. So if we choose a level, the game begins. But we, uh, we need to get rid of all of the initial state that we had um, to begin with, we don't want to have um, a, a level already selected. We don't want to have um, a default size. The grid needs to be empty. So I'm just going to get rid of all of this. Let remaining equal zero. Let duration equal zero. Um, and we don't even want to show this countdown unless uh, the game is currently active. So we're just going to wrap this whole thing in a if playing. OK. So now we can pick a harder level if we want. We can choose medium. And, and we see that we have some, some broken CSS. That's because we're not passing the size of the, of the game board down to the grid component. Uh, we can fix that with a CSS custom property. And we can then use that inside the grid component. If we just find the CSS declaration where we hard-coded for, 
get rid of that and replace it with uh, var size. Right, we can now play uh, a medium game or we can play a hard game and everything will shrink down accordingly. So we just need to communicate the win state and the loss state. And then our game is basically complete. If we've found all of the pairs, we can dispatch a, uh, a win event. And if the countdown runs out, we can dispatch a lose event. And if someone hits the countdown button, then we can set playing to false so that the countdown timer doesn't continue. And we can also dispatch a pause event. And then in the top component, page.svelte, we can add handlers for each of those changes of state. Uh, okay, it is telling us that we immediately lost the game. And I think I know why that is. It's because inside game.svelte, we're calling the countdown function as soon as the component is mounted, which we do not want. Instead, we want that countdown to start when uh, the game is resumed or when we start the game. So if we get rid of that on mount call, um, it should take us to the welcome screen where we can start the uh, start the game. It is not counting down right now. Oh, that's backwards. All right, unfortunately, the only way to check that this works is to actually play the game. Did we see the red bird already? No, not there. I think we saw the alligator. Oh man, I'm so bad at this. Okay, and it shows us that if we do in fact win the game, it'll send us the you won the game message.